Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I'm your host, Greg Fitzsimmons, on a beautiful summer day. Get near the 4th of July, so the fireworks in Venice Beach are fucking constant. I feel like I'm living in Iraq. Dogs are freaking the fuck out. And uh, oh, and by the way, if you're checking out my jersey, uh, this was made by uh, Adrian Myers, who's at a company called Jog Athletics, and asked me if I'd like a hockey jersey because I play hockey. And he designed this. And uh, check this shit out. How about that? Huh? See the back? Nice, huh? Yeah. Can't wait to lace them up again and get out on the ice looking like a fucking lunatic. These are not for sale. This was just done for me. So thank you very much, Adrian. Much appreciated. I'm going to wear the shit out of this. Um, if you want to get the t-shirts, the Grapefruit Simmons t-shirts, those uh, same, same logo, but on the t-shirt, those uh, we just got a bunch of new ones in. We were sold out. New shipments arrived. If you want to get those, go to the fitzdog.com website. Pick them up. Um, I was thinking about, because, you know, I got Jonathan Katz on the show today, and he, he came in a couple weeks ago, and we did a very nice interview. He's one of my heroes. I'm psyched to have him on. And uh, I thought, you know, and then I do my little intro, and uh, I realize I got nothing to talk about. I have no fucking idea. I mean, nothing happens in my life. I can tell you about watching The Wire. I can tell you about trying to throw a move on my wife when both the kids are out of the house, which is fucking rare. I can tell you about how I'm trying to cook. I don't know. There's just, there's very little that happens. I golf. Once a week, I golf on Friday mornings. And I'm not complaining. Uh, I'm making no money, really, on the road. I'm home. But uh, I don't know what to talk about. I, I got dates coming up. I don't even know if I should plug them or not. They're, they're coming up and supposed to be in Arizona in August, which I think is a hot spot. And so I don't know. There's a lot of hot spots all of a sudden. All the states that were, they were thumbing their noses at masks and uh, yelling at liberals for covering their faces are now fucking spiking in cases. So nobody knows where to go. Nobody knows what the right answer is. But I got dates in the fall, September, October, November. I don't know. I, I hope they're happening. I need to get the fuck out there. I don't remember my act. It's going to be all new. Better material than I used to do. I've already decided. I've been writing like a fiend. And uh, it's going to be it's gonna be different. It's going to be different. Uh, some guys are on the road already. Uh, what's uh, D.L. Hughley? He just, uh, I forget where he was, but he passed out on stage. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love D.L. I think he's a great comic and he's a friend. But, uh, man, you want to talk about being relevant. A black man right now with coronavirus who's a comedian who's in trouble. I mean, that you can't get more front page than that shit. He is talked about. He's covering all the bases. Check, 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 check. I don't know what else he can do. Um, but I wish him a speedy recovery. I hope he's okay. And uh, I hope that whatever this publicity stunt he pulled, I hope it plays out well for him and the black movements and the corona movements, and the comedian movement. He's integral to all these different facets of society. Anyway, um, so I was thinking about what to talk about, and obviously this statues thing is pretty big. It's look weird that I have on green with a green wall, and my eyes are fucking beautifully green. Do you see how green they are? Yeah. Sadly, I've always had beautiful eyes, but... Um, hidden by a shelved Cro-Magnon style brow. So you can't really see how pretty my eyes are until you get in tight. And that's where I get you. I would meet girls, not impressed. Then I'd get in close and they'd go, wow, now you got me. And then they'd see my penis and they'd go, holy shit, this guy's got the eyes and the penis? Hey now. Who knows? I could be like, should I hold up my penis? Anyway, 
uh, statues is in the news, and I was thinking about what a big deal it is right now that people are screaming and yelling about. First of all, statues, do we care? Does it, do we care about statues? It's like the lowest form of art. We don't even bring it inside. It's art that we leave out to get rained on and shit on. It's just, it's whatever, you know? And it, and they're dirty. A lot of them, I mean, if you look at ancient statues, the first statues were like dudes with giant schlongs playing the fiddle. It was like, or the flute. It was, it was like really erotic. Early art was very erotic and statues especially. Like you look at, um, even if you look at like ancient Roman art, because I remember we were, in, we were in Italy two summers ago and it's just uncanny how sexy some of this shit is. And it's out in the piazza and it's like a chick with the, you know, turning sideways with a beautiful, like, like a C cup with a raised nipple, with an eraser, a pencil eraser nipple and looking you in the eyes. And, uh, and, you, and, and then the penises on the men were, were very uh, detailed, I would say, very, very um, anatomically correct. Like the, the shaft would come down and to be, be a little bend to it, be a light bend and then a definition where the crown started, and then a little slit underneath it, and a light Roman kind of pubic hair, a very, uh, almost like a Van Gogh-ish looking pubic hair area. And you really gotta think, you gotta think for a second, if this guy is, is sculpting this thing in the town square, and he's got his hand on the penis, and he's there for two or three days, working the penis from every angle, eventually people have gotta be like, Think you got the penis. Yeah, think you got it. Okay, move on a leg, maybe a foot. Take it easy on the penis. What's his name? I got upset about the nudity in, um, was it John Ashcroft? It was the Halls of Justice, I think. There was these two women statues that were made a century ago. And they're, you know, topless. And John Ashcroft, who's one of these fucking born-again lunatic Christians, draped them before a press conference. He, they spent $10,000 on blue drapes to put over the breasts because he thought it was shameful. He was ashamed of the human body. That's fucking lunacy. And, and they were nice tits. Like, they were bronze. Like, I remember them being nice bronze titties. Beautiful. I mean, think about, you know, I hate to say it, maybe this is going to bother some people, but like, what about Jesus? What about Jesus on the cross? I remember in my church looking up at the wall and Jesus was like, he was a slim, he was like, he was like 5'11", 165 pounds with abs, shredded abs, and that loincloth would come just, just above the pubic line as he turned sideways and his arms were flailed out, open, vulnerable. His little ankles crossed across each other. I, I had gay thoughts. I'm not going to lie to you. I would have to confess. I would be in the confessional. No, that's not true. But it was sexy. Jesus was a sexy dude. But the big thing is now, uh, I guess, the Columbus statue. I don't know. Is that coming down in Times Square or Columbus Circle, obviously, in New York? Will they bring it down? Um, there's a Teddy Roosevelt statue where he's got an Indian on one side and a slave on the other, and uh, people are unsure about whether to pull that down. Um, I mean, it's kind of hypocritical because the liberals were all giving Ashcroft shit about draping that statue, but at the same time, they want these other depictions that they don't like taken down. And I don't know. I, don't, I honestly don't know the answer. Here's the thing about me I'm not that guy. I'm not that comic that tells you how it is. I don't have strong opinions. I'm more of a seeker. I'm, I'm inquisitive and I weigh things and I'm fucking confused and lost like most of you in the middle. And maybe that's why my career has stalled out in the middle because I'm not emphatic. I don't go, fuck you, leave the fucking statue up because you're a fucking cunt. I don't know. I don't know what I believe all the time. I just, I, 
I think about simple shit, chocolate ice cream and dogs, and yeah, politics. But I was thinking about the slave, the slave one, because um, I think we should be able to. I think we should leave up statues, but you can maybe adjust them somehow. Like, what if, what if, like, you left Columbus up there, but then there's a an Indian and a slave, and they're crouching and they're shitting on his head. There's like pieces of shit on the sides of his head and the slave and the Indian are laughing their asses off. Like, can we just add that? Because then we could say, if you, if you want to leave up your statue, we leave up our statue. What about all the uh, Confederate statues? You know, Robert E. Lee, why is there a statue of the losing general? Okay, you can leave it up. But if there's a Robert E. Lee statue, he must have a white flag in his hand, waving the flag of surrender. Just add that, and I think we're all good. And, and, and his other hand, George Washington's cock, because that's, that's how the war ended. Him cupping Washington's flaccid cock and begging for forgiveness. I think every Confederate statue has got to have a Union guy's dick in his hand. Then I think we can, we can all go, go about uh, leaving our artwork up without... People are so fucking upset about it. I think my, uh, my hometown, Caitlyn Jenner is fan. I did it right, everybody. I didn't accidentally say Bruce. I said Caitlyn Jenner, because you're not supposed to ever refer to Caitlyn as Bruce, even if you're talking about it in the past. Like, I'm from Tarrytown, and I'm, I seem to remember he held all the, the records at our high school. In, you know, for, for uh, track and field. He had, he had all the records. And uh, I'm, I should have looked this up. I have some memory that there was a statue of him, of her, but when he was a him. And I wonder, should that statue change? Should we grab a chisel, make a little adjustment to Bruce? I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm curious. What do you guys think about statues? Write me, fitzdogradio at gmail.com. I read all your emails. You know that. If you email me, I get back to you. It's the kind of guy I am. I spend fucking a lot of time every day doing it, but I enjoy it. I love interacting. I get the, uh, we get a lot of the colloquialism sent in, the overheards get sent in through the, through the, um, the you can go to the website and just look for the email icon on the website. Icon? What am I? What am I, the guy that doesn't understand the internet? Um, all right, let's get to some colloquialisms. These are old sayings that your people used to say. Should have branded this segment. Come up with a name for it. Craig Godet, who I believe has written a song for Sunday Papers. I think he did. Uh, he said his father would say, after a wet fart, that's going to itch when it dries. That one I've already used. Used that at the dinner table the other night. That's gonna itch when it dries. And that's a, that's a big thing on, as you know, I, I watch a lot of TikTok. And that's a big one on TikTok is uh, people laying wet farts in like Home Depot, like just walking past people and ripping wet, nasty, long ass farts. Which, uh, you know, is a scary thing to do because when you think about it, you, you have very few real responsibilities as a human being, especially as a man. All you really try to do is not die. Um, you wanna not kill somebody. You wanna not rape anybody. And you wanna not shit your pants. That's a big one. And there's a lot of apparatus set up in your body. You know, your colon has a lot of counters. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, thermometer it is like it takes your temperature it, it it i think it measures relative humidity it knows what's coming down the pipe and then your asshole at the last second can even be a a, a a safety check and grab it at the last second so a wet fart is really a sign of confidence it says yeah i've been warned i'm fucking going for it anyway and the 
the upside is you make a sound that will produce shrills of laughter from everybody around you. Tom Peterson says, my Irish grandpa, Clarence McShane. He said, and if your aunt had balls, she'd be your uncle. That is something that some kids are dealing with. Some people's aunts are becoming their uncles. And we just talked about Caitlyn Jenner. And I remember Kevin Meany had a really funny joke about this. Uh, the, God, I'm gonna paraphrase, but it was something like the Lobermans coming over. And Mr. Loberman just got back from Sweden where he had a sex change operation. So if you have anything to say to him all, just tell him he looks pretty. I think that was it. God, I miss that motherfucker. Kevin Meany was just the funniest guy. I think I, think I can safely say the funniest guy I've ever known. Christopher Pryor said, my grandpa used to say, you smell like the southbound end of a northbound horse. Yeah, I think a lot of these came from farms. A lot of these were Irish people, and a lot of them came from farms. I should close my window. As you know, I'm over by the airport, and there's a lot of fucking flying on a Friday. Um, and then uh, Joe Butwell said, my wife's grandmother was an ex-army nurse, avid golfer. She shared this with my wife while on the green. Quote, the secret to putting is you don't move a hair on your twat. How much do I love the word twat? Is it, I don't know if it's a cancel word. Is it part of the cancel? Because I fucking love it. It twat. It's, it's, it's automatopoeia. Is that when a word sounds like what it is? Um, like sneeze sounds like a sneeze. Is that what automatopoeia is? I can't remember. But uh, twat sounds like the forming of a, your mouth is like a vagina. What? Nick Gerlich says, I came in with a black eye after a brawl the night before. Grandfather says, looks like someone was talking when they should have been listening. That's a good lesson for the kids. No one to talk, no one to listen. And that's the thing is I've, I've always been a small guy with a big mouth and I've gotten out of a lot of fights because I know when to transition from talk shit to listening without backing down you look the guy in the eye and you're not going to get punched in the face if you just shut the fuck up overheards we haven't done these in a while we've been so busy with the colloquialisms we haven't done overheards here's one from charlie wick young berkeley college couple walking past me 19 year old girl says I'm really curious exactly how hot Helen of Troy was. The 19 year old boy says, no kidding. I bet she was a total hottie. I have thought about this my whole life. If you've studied Greek history, was that Helen of Troy? Troy, Greek or Roman? I think it was Greek, yeah. It's how the, it's how the Peloponnesian War started. Yeah, but the face that launched a thousand ships, that was Helen of Troy. And you really always wonder because sometimes you look at like, I see, you ever see photographs of, of like your grandmother? Any women from like the 1930s, they were fucking horrible looking. And the hair, I know part of it was the hairdos were just, we were not used to them, but they had horse faces. I don't know, they, did they not have makeup back then? Did they not ever exercise their jowls? Like everybody just had fat, featureless faces with the little twirling hair, the little uh, uh, Princess Leia hair, and, uh, and they look terrible. But this, this Helen of Troy, she must have really been something. You know, I think Angelina Jolie played her in a movie, which was a good pick. Doesn't get any hotter than that. Dave Lawson was standing in line at Wendy's waiting for my food. A mother walks in with her two kids, Kid number one, maybe nine, says, I want a spicy chicken sandwich. Mom says, you know, that is really spicy. It will make your asshole burn when you shit. If I'm nine, that's an upside. You kidding me? It's going to burn my asshole? You don't care. When you're nine, you want all kinds of new shit to happen. You want new sensations. You haven't even touched your penis yet. You haven't even felt that joy. 
but you felt your asshole. When you're nine, you've stuck a pencil up your ass and you've played with it a little bit. You felt some sensations, it felt good. And now mom's saying, not only are you gonna have a delicious Wendy's chicken sandwich, but when you shit, it's gonna tingle and burn a little bit. Yeah. Maybe the creepiest overheard I've ever done. Finally, Andrew Fisher says, four or five year old girl at the supermarket says to her mother, do you like daddy? Mother says, of course I love daddy. Little girl, then why do you say such mean things to him? Record skip, cello plays, flatware falls on the ground, oboe. That's a fucking tough moment. There's a wake up call for that mom. Holy shit. Holy shit, there is a dissonance between how I feel about my husband and the way I am talking to him in front of my children. The modeling I'm doing for a relationship in front of my kids is poor. Take that shit in. If you're married, even if you're in a relationship, think about it. Don't, don't be mean. Be gentle and kind, everybody. And then they're kind to you and the world is a better place. I think you get into relationships where you just get stuck in a rut where you're shitty to each other. And you don't have to be. Me and my wife, we've always been polite, kind. And that's what a marriage is. You know, there's all these other, oh, we, are, we, we grew apart. You know, he cheated. No, be kind. That's 95% of it. That's your message for today. Go out into the world and take that with you. All right, my guest today, oh, I should remind you, I'm doing a ton of cameos lately. If you want to send a message to a friend or a loved one from me, I have a lot of fun doing them. Go to Cameo, the app, and send it off. It's 50 bucks, but it's a pretty good fucking deal. Also, the premium membership is less than $20 a year. You can get over 800 back episodes of the show. Uh, go to the website to get that as well premium membership. Very fulfilling. My guest today is the great Jonathan Katz. When I started out in comedy in Boston, this is the guy who is one of the legends, one of the guys that like every single comic respected the shit out of Jonathan Katz. Or respects, still does. But I'm not there anymore, so I said past tense. But he's very much still out there. He's, uh, he's had a rough time with um, MS over the years. Uh, but he's still, uh, do, he's doing a podcast now. He's He's the best. He really is uh, just, just such a smart, funny, cool dude. And I was honored that he came on the show. So here's my chat with the great Jonathan Katz. And we're off. Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I mm. sit about 3,000 miles away from, where are you, Newton, Mass? Newton, Massachusetts. Newton, Massachusetts, home yep. to, uh, well, Jonathan Katz, my guest, but also... Uh, what, Conan O'Brien, Brian Kiley. Louis C.K. Louis C.K. Conan actually grew up in Brooklyn. Oh, he did. Next town yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Who else was B from Newton? B.J. Novak. Oh, sure. From The Office. John Krasinski. From The Office. Um, well, I, every time I say something, you say from The Office. Why is from that? The Office. Okay. So that was, I was watching Bobcat talking to you about Jack Burns. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was my idol when I was like a teenager. I, my, me and my cousin would listen to Burns and Schreiber for over and over again. Yeah, I and, think I have one of their comedy albums. Yeah. I used to collect um, comedy albums. Did you collect comedy albums? I didn't know I was collecting. I thought I was just buying them. But yeah. I, guess, I guess I was collecting them. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done this podcast called Comedy on Vinyl? No, what's that? Oh wait, I think maybe I did. With Jason something or other. You talk do you talk about an album? Yeah. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of fun. Yeah, I think I talked about uh Bruce Springsteen album. Uh which one did you talk about? Burns and Schreiber. Oh, oh no kidding. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. And every time I talk to my friend David Mamet, and I'm not dropping names. He says to me, Congratulations. It's been one minute and 45 seconds okay. until you okay. dropped a name. Yeah. That was great. 
He says to me, boo de re boo do relief, my friends, the sound of the communist frog. Um, because he also was into Burns and Trevor. Uh you guys you guys are roommates. I thought you guys were roommates at Harvard, but no, you were roommates at like Goddard, Goddard. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Where the hell's that? It's in Vermont, and you could actually get credit for taking drugs. <laughs> oh. Did you guys trip together? He was not into drugs. He was into um, he was into sex and rock and roll. Yeah. And and I'm not even sure he was into rock and roll. Yeah. But he and I would very, <laughs> sometimes be competing for the affections of the same young woman. Yeah. And one night she showed up. I, th I thought I was bringing her to my room at my dorm, but it turns out I was bringing her to David's room. I didn't realize it. <laughs> and and he uh, and when I got there just to say goodnight to them, he threw me out into the snow. He's a very burly guy, David. Um, but you know we've we've been friends for t more than twenty five years. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, what am I talking about? More no, than 50 25. Years. Yeah. 50 years. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Greg, Greg, I'm 73 years old. Jesus, God damn it, young man. There's no way you're 75. Um, and you're black? I'm a black woman. Finally. I need diversity on my podcast. Yeah. Well, that would make my wife so happy if, if, if only I was a black woman. She's... <laughs> My wife works for a nonprofit in Boston called the Lenny Zakin Fund, uh -huh. and she's a better person than either of us. Yeah. Although your career has pretty much been non not for profit as well, hasn't it? Yeah, but that's not that's not deliberately. <laughs> just can't nobody. I can't give this stuff away. Just <laughs> just to give a sense of uh, Jonathan Katz and his career. I went on Google today to look up, you know, what's going on with Jonathan Katz this, these days, which is a lot, and we're going to get into that. Um, the first Jonathan Katz that popped up is the chairman and CEO of Katz Entertainment. Right. The second Google search comes up for uh, Jonathan Katz, a rabbi in Sarasota, Florida, who's looking for someone to give him a haircut. Uh, the third Jonathan Katz is a sports psychologist in Austin, Texas. Yeah, that's me. And then finally, uh, there's the Associated Press Bureau Chief in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And then Whoa. comedian Jonathan Katz pops but up. But there's also, there's also a Jonathan Katz who wrote a book called The, the History of, of Heterosexuality. Oh, no, I think it actually was The History of Homosexuality. He's uh -huh. a, a gay activist. Yeah. Um, and also a Jonathan Katz who wrote a book called Black Woman, which I own. Black I, Woman? Yeah, uh -huh. I, I never read it. I just anything written by a Jonathan Katz, I will buy. <laughs> That's a good market. I mean, these yeah. are successful people. You're in good company. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about what's going on with you. You got um, what's this thing made? What's this thing called? Um, where is it? Doors of Stone. What is that? That's another Jonathan Katz. I have no idea. That's not you. No, honestly, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> you know, I have- Maybe a you have less going on than I yeah. thought. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pseudonym called, called Kid, Kid Gloves, uh -huh. one, one of my pseudonyms. Yeah. And I got a royalty check for almost a half a million dollars for some song recorded by Kid Gloves, who's another Are you serious? Guy. Yeah. No and kidding. It, and, you know, I gave it back to, to after because it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, but apparently there's a rapper who that's his pseudonym as well. Whoa. Yeah. Um, is, is he a tough gangster rapper and he would have come out to Newton looking for you? I don't, give me another kind of rapper. Rapper. <laughs> that's the only one. No. Hey, Greg, I've been staring at these two picket pictures behind you for hours. Yeah. Is the one on, on my left. Is that Springsteen or Dylan? It's Springsteen. My brother was nice enough. There's this artist called uh, 
Pinto, who's in Brooklyn, and uh, my brother loves the guy, so he got me a piece of his work, and it's a Bruce Springsteen portrait. I didn't have the heart to tell him it looks more like Bob Dylan, but that's fine because oh, I like them both. And Jimi Hendrix. And Jimi Hendrix, it was a, a co free concert in San Francisco in 1967, and that was the concert poster. That's great, both that of was, them. I was in San Francisco in a record store, and I bought it. I don't have anything except that yellow mic and so much audio equipment, and I have a, uh, a Nerf gun. Oh, that's Just fun. So powerful. It looks like a toy, but let's see if you could hear the speed. Wow. Did you hear that? Now, is that in case small children uh, try to burglarize your house? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, or small people. Little people. Yeah. Um, and then your office is also, uh, it looks like you've got a shelf in the back that's got some old audio equipment in it. Yeah, that's, my audio, that's my audio museum. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I have a, I have a reel to reel machine there. Uh huh. I have a, something called an L cassette, which was a format developed by uh, Sony, which never caught on. Uh huh. I think I, I bought it at a, at a tag sale in, in Rhode Island. That's like the Sony Betamax. It was actually a better, better quality. I think it was three quarter inch instead of half right. inch tape, right. and it was much richer. But for some reason, it didn't catch on, and the and the VHS did. Yeah, I I got a call once from a guy who said he has a a videotape of my wife having sex with a German Shepherd. <laughs> And I said, beta or VHS? <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't said that joke in years. But you led me into it. <laughs> you just sent a tweet about your wife. You said something like, my wife has gone into, I found out my wife has gone into quarantine with another man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no such luck. Uh, no. How long have you been with your wife? 38 years. 38 years. Yeah. yeah. So, and this is a typical conversation that Susie and I have. Um, Susie, have I ever told you about, yes, you have. <laughs> you're, you're married 11 years. Am I right about that? 21. Oh, 21. I thought it was 11. Yeah, 21. Yeah. Maybe. No, she was 11 when we got oh, married. She was your childhood sweetheart. She was, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, and um, now we're, we're, uh, we're happily married, hopefully heading towards uh, your guys' distance. I feel like yeah. it takes a special woman to put up with the lifestyle of a stand-up comedian. Not just the lifestyle, the, it's where our minds go, yeah. you know? It's, just not like living with a civilian, you know? Right. I'm not saying we're better or worse, we're just different. Yeah, it takes a, it takes a certain amount of like, I find my wife is very consistent. She's a very like, uh, you know, very linear kind of person. And right. so, so she's able to sort of like keep things moving forward. Whereas when you're a comedian, yeah. you can spin out into you know, uh, getting hyper-focused on something or just kind of fantastical about things. And you need yeah. that person who's going to actually uh, make the plans. Great. Yeah, that's my wife, too. Yeah. You know, the thing I resent most of all about wives and mothers is that they're almost always right. Yeah. That's been my experience. Yeah, it's um, true. And I, I find that, especially with raising the kids, when we have an issue with one of our kids. And you know, we, I, I think about how much me and my wife talk about our kids and, and strategize and try to empathize and go into therapy and all this stuff. And I think about my parents, they didn't do anything and they weren't that bad, right. you know? I mean, right. I, I got raised by them and they, they went out drinking. My parents went out drinking three or four nights a week. They used to come at like two o'clock in the morning. The only time we got in trouble was like if we did really bad on our report card but they weren't riding us. Right. And uh, sometimes I wonder like if I'm doing my kids a service 
But you're right. I default to my wife almost every time when we're discussing how to handle something with the kids. Yeah. And and are you, is one child more challenging than another? Yes. In, in what way? Uh, well, boys are. I think boys are just easier. My son is a jock, so he, ever since he was like you know seven years old, he was always on at least one and sometimes two soccer teams, and that kept him busy, kind of kept him out of trouble, and he's a very like he's kind of hyper, but he knows how to channel it. Right. And then my daughter's a dreamer, you know, she's kind of an artist and she surfs and she's very deep. We have like amazing deep conversations, but, um, but trying to keep her focused and um, engaged is, is a bit of a challenge. And I think girls, girls yeah. get very affected how, by how, their social group also. How old is she? She'll be 17 in a couple of weeks. Do you think she'd find me attractive? Do you have headshots? Can you send some headshots? Uh, I'm going to send her an MRI, a recent MRI. <laughs> yeah, I think I think she'd she'd find you adorable. I mean, you, you know, know, as long as David Mamet doesn't show up, I think you got a shot. Yeah, you know who my next call is today after you? Who? Patty Lupone. Oh. And that time I was dropping a name. Wait, she was just in the news. She just said something that got in the news. What was it? I don't know. Um, but I've known her for about, she was one of two women I actually thought I was going on a date with. But uh, I was wrong. I was just going over for dinner. <laughs> her boyfriend was um, a movie star, whose name I can't think of, who also went to Juilliard uh -huh. with Robin. Um, and so you showed up and he was there no no I showed up and I and I think I might have commented on how full and sensual her lips were uh -huh. and she said do you want the uh, the pasta or the uh... now I just <laughs> but that was you know, it's a bad sign when you say that, and then she starts kind of yeah. sucking her lips in. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's the worst is like, you ever talk to a woman who's got cleavage, and you don't realize that you've snuck a peek, and then all of a sudden yeah. she like buttons another button or right. pulls her shirt up? That's yep. the worst, creepiest feeling in the world. All we try to do as men is try not to be creepy. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Um, he was in a movie called Inside Out, her boyfriend. Okay. Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Wow. And a movie called uh, Sophie's Choice, too. Yeah. It's a wonderful actor. He is. Fish Called Wanda was amazing in that. Um, he did this movie with Dimitri Martin. Oh, yeah? Yeah, which was... Not a great movie, but it was a, a fan of Dimitri Martin's a lot. Yeah. I think um, Dimitri Martin is one of the many comedians that have been inspired by you. That um, I was thinking about just in the Boston scene. I know you and Wendy Liebman are still close. Yeah. I think about like what an inspiration you were to Wendy Liebman. And uh, there was a lot of people you know, in Boston you, that. I think it was Bill Broaddus that inspired Wendy Liebman. I was going to say Bill brought us with somebody else who was inspired by you. No, I don't. I think Bill was on his own path. Bill brought us is the funniest guy in the world who doesn't know he's funny. Uh -huh. You know, he's teaching, I think, I think, you know, it's at BU now. Oh, is that he, right? He's teaching screenwriting and uh, something else, maybe TV writing. Wow. That's, that's where I went to college. Yeah. Um, and I heard you mention Tarrytown to somebody else. Is that's where you grew up? That's where I grew up. Yeah. And what is where is Tarrytown? Is that Tarrytown is north of Westchester, or is it in Westchester? No, it's in Westchester. It's about fifteen miles north of uh, the city, and it's right, right on the Hudson River. It's where the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge cuts across the Hudson right. River. 
Yeah. It's a historic old town. It's where uh, Washington Irving lived there. So like the legend of Sleepy Hollow is all based in Tarrytown. So the high school uh, mascot was the Headless Horseman. Right. Well, that is sweet. I, I, mean, I, don't, know what to, I don't know what to say, Greg. I don't know. I, I, feel, like, I feel like that's that's worth bringing up in a conversation. I mean, what was your high school mascot? I went to high, I went to Bayside High, uh, and I, I only had one friend, and I'm not sure he liked me. <laughs> a, a guy named Al, Alfonso Grimes. We just waited for the bus together. <laughs> Never spoke. I had no friends in high school. Oh, would, cut it out. I don't believe I, I'm that. I'm serious. I would go into Manhattan at night, and where I learned how to play table tennis, and be, ultimately became the New York State champion. That's right. That's right. Where was the place that you played in the city? On 96th and Broadway. Yes, I know that place. A yeah. friend of mine played there growing up. He, he grew up right in that neighborhood and he used to play there. What it was, was his like name? A world, uh, his name is uh, Josh. Uh, why am I forgetting his last name? He's a little bit younger than you. Actually, not that much younger than you. He had a twin brother and they both played there a lot. Oh. Yeah. Um, so Bayside, oh, I think my ask Bayside me what style, Queens. My my father was born in Bayside Queens. Oh really? Yeah. Ask me what style of, of table tennis I played. What style of table tennis do you play? Defensive. Uh sorry, that's <laughs> I'm not sure it was worth it. Yeah. Your dad grew up in Bayside? He did, and then he moved to the Bronx. I think when he was like Seven or eight, he moved to Riverdale. I think they made some money, and he moved to move. People think when you move from Queens to the Bronx, that's a downgrade, but not if it's Riverdale. That's right. That's where Stu Smiley grew up. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. And then his brother, uh, Frank Smiley. Frank Smiley, right? Who works on Conan? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do that show occasionally? I used to do it all the time when I lived in New York. I probably did it like six or seven times. Right. And then, uh, and then I kind of stopped caring about doing late night talk shows because I always found that I was given so many notes, and it became so pressurized to do these five minutes, and I never felt at the end like it represented my act. Great. And I started thinking more about trying to do like um, specials, um, but I've only done two of those. I'm trying to do another one of those now. You know, I, I was I was inspired. I'm I am inspired by guys like you, Seinfeld, David Tell, who will take some time off and write a new hour, which I have finally done during this pandemic. Oh, have you really? Uh, yeah, same jokes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you decided to type it in instead of handwrite yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Change, just change the font. <laughs> Well, I feel like reading your tweets, I feel like you've got some, you've got some gems. You got some new jokes. One of them in particular, I thought was brilliant. You wrote, uh, the suicide note is a dying art form. Yeah. What a perfect joke. Oh, thank you so much. I, you know, I didn't realize that I, I wrote one-liners. I mean, that is a one-liner, Yeah, obviously. But I forgot, I didn't realize how many I have of those. Yeah. Um, but unlike Stephen Wright, I also have bits. Yeah. And Ke Brian Kiley, he has to time his act out so carefully if he's going to do a 30-minute set or a 40-minute set. He has to time it out joke by joke. Right, right. Huh? Yeah, I used to watch him every year. Um, he went – I used to, pre I used to uh, do a uh, comedy show at Boston University after I graduated. I did it for 25 years. Every year during uh, graduation weekend, we would do a stand-up <laughs> comedy show. With I'm picturing you being held back for 25 years, not giving you a <laughs> diploma. Okay, Greg, four more years and you're out of here. <laughs> and without the diploma, how am I going to continue yeah. in stand-up comedy? Right. And, uh, and so we used to do this show that was all alumni comedians, comics that went to BU. There was Mark Maron, right. Jeffrey Ross. Um, guy named Mike Kaplan, who's really funny. 
And, uh, and so Kylie took like a couple acting classes at BU. So I just pretend that he went there just because I wanted him on the show. And it was like my greatest joy every year to sit in the audience and watch Brian Kylie do 30 minutes of material. Oh my God. He's so brilliant. Oh my God. Um, and, and, and it's so consistent. I mean, there's not a dud. He'll do 30 no. minutes of one liners and there's not a dud in them. It's true. Um, I'm trying, I've been trying to think of where you and I actually met for the first time. I and feel like, I feel like it was, we were at the Providence Comedy Connection, which was one of the toughest rooms. It's gotten yeah. much better. It's actually a good room now. But back then, it was filled with like hardcore guidos from East Providence. Right. And it was a lot of attitude. And the acts that did really well there were the in-your-face kind of loud Boston acts. And I remember, and I had a quote that I actually wrote down of yours to kind of give people some context because that was the scene in Boston at the time. It was very testosterone-y. Um, and there, there became another scene that became a little more esoteric and um, a little uh, more experimental. Uh, but that was, this was before that. So you're working at the Providence Common Connection. And I found a, a quote on your website where you talk about how it was for you as a low energy, smart comic. And you said, I had reached a national audience. This is after you'd done Letterman like eight times. I'd reached right. a national audience, but our country remained stuck in its old ways. It is hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And the USA was, at, was acting like an old dog when I tried to ply my trade. In clubs, I often felt like I was wearing a tutu while performing for pirates. I was <laughs> just not what they had in mind. Nobody's fault. And, uh, and I thought of us the first time we met at the Providence Comedy Connection in the green room. Right. I come in and you were already there and you had all of your bills. You were paying, you had a calculator oh, no. and your bills and a checkbook out and you were I, paying your bills. I have to tell my wife because I haven't paid my bills since then. She does, I've been doing our bills for years. Uh, Greg, see, I, I have a different memory of how you and I met. Okay. It's like, <clears throat> We were both, it was a club, it was like a one night or somewhere. And after the show, you approached me about doing a benefit for a temple in uh, somewhere in Sudbury, I think, a synagogue. Uh -huh. And I said to you, geez, I had no idea you were Jewish. And you started talking about your bar mitzvah and your uh, hiding the Afi Coleman. Uh -huh. I thought this was going to be a much funnier bit, but I'm sorry. <laughs> just, Wait a just, minute. <laughs> just suggesting you were hiding behind that name Fitzsimmons all these years. <laughs> I think that was James Lemer. I think that you were. That was oh, yeah. Yeah. And then another time, the first time we went in a, on a road gig together, because in Boston, there used to be these shows that we did, mm. and it would be on a Tuesday night. Like in Boston, you worked on the road, sometimes in town, on the weekends, yeah. there was a lot of comedy clubs in town. The Comedy Connection, um, Nick's Comedy Stop, Dick Darty's Room. And then on a Tuesday night, you'd go do a Chinese restaurant in like Manchester, New Hampshire. Right. And so you and I got in the car together. I drove out to your house in Newton and I got into your car and we drove. I, it was far. I remember it was like a couple hours. Wait, was I, were, dri was I driving? You were driving. Yeah. Oh my fucking God. And so we're driving up there, and at the time you were developing Dr. Katz, and you were literally right. listening to cassette tapes on the way up, and you were asking me my opinion on a different voiceover actors who, and who was going to play your receptionist. Right. It ended up being Sarah Silverman's sister, Laura Silverman. Laura, right. Excuse and, me for one second. Yeah. And we, we heard her voice, and you were just like, you were like, this is it she's perfect yeah she's uh, we still are good friends and I, I you know we did a dr cat's the audio book for audible oh you did yeah and oh that's great yeah and i we did the next time you have 62 hours to kill you should get that book because it's really funny and we You're did saying you kill for 62 hours no but the the cat we had a bigger cast. Um, Laura Silverman, 
John Benjamin, and Erica Rhodes. Do you know who she is? I know she Erica. Did? She's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. She played Laura's sister. Uh huh. And Rick Overton played the janitor in my office building. You know Rick a bit. Yeah, very well. Um, and it was, and I wrote and edited every episode, and it was a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but they paid me a shitload of money to do it. That's great. And every every time I got a check from Audible, I thought it was a mistake because it wasn't that hard, you know. Well, luckily it didn't go to that rapper. Yes. Um, but, uh, so. Wait, so was it different? Was it just like uh, the original Dr. Katz? You, or how, did, no, how was we, it different? We, we wrote new episodes. That, that's what made it different. It was all new episodes. And it was the same thing with comedians would come in and, and you would just. Yeah. Inter- oh, that's great. Yeah. But. For me, the show is never never about the comedians. It was always about my relationship with Ben and with Laura. Right. That's what made the show fun for me. Right, right. John Which Benjamin has taught me how to improvise. I had no idea I could do it. Oh, no kidding, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's and fantastic. And, and his, his improvising with uh, Laura was good. With you, it was good. He was just like... Uh, he just made weird choices. He always made interesting choices. Oh, it's so different. His comedy is so different than being a comedian. Yeah. It just was, it was a lesson for me because I I would be, he, he would be able to see where I was going with a joke and he would just take it in a totally different direction. Uh-huh. Which would, it's what makes him so brilliant. And how did you, how did you first meet him and, and, and end up casting him? I met John through Cross Comedy, which was uh-huh. da- yeah. David Cross's troupe that sure. worked out at Catch a Rising Star in, Bo- in Cambridge. Yeah. And he and Laura were going out together uh-huh. and continued to go out together during the run of the show. Did not get along that well, ultimately. And the worse they got along, the better the show was. No kidding. Yeah, because... You could feel the tension from the very start of the show, but it got more real wow. as you got into it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, he's he's an interesting dude. He he follows his own path. That's for sure. I like it when you know that cross comedy scene was. It was a really interesting time because we were talking about you know pro- the province comedy connection, and then it was very tough. I think for low energy acts, smart acts, Brian Kiley, Jonathan Groff. And so this cross comedy thing popped up in Cambridge at Catch a Rising Star in Harvard Square. And it was a place that this guy, Robin Horton, kind of developed. A, a, so it was almost like a safe space for right. comedians. And the audiences were very smart and they were very supportive. And the type of comedy that was there was very interesting. And cross comedy was, it was, uh, you used to do it. And then... It was Louis C.K. and Mark Marin and uh, Paul Kozlowski. Yeah. I wasn't part of that troupe, though. No, um, but you would come in and perform on the shows sometimes, right? Maybe. I don't actually yeah. remember. But I remember when, you know, I remember when David Cross complimented me on a joke. Uh-huh. I also remember when Dennis Miller complimented me on a joke. Yeah. What um, was the joke? Well, the David Cross joke was, I don't believe in the supernatural, but I do believe in the super duper natural. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I can remember the Dennis Miller joke, it was about my dad. Uh-huh. Um, oh, I think it was, I, I wanted to tell my dad I loved him and I didn't know, so I called him and I said, how you doing? And he said, pretty good. And he said, okay, just checking. Is how it something like that? Yeah, that's the joke, but how the <laughs> fuck do you know that? That's ridiculous that you should know that. Is it in my bio? It's in your bio, yeah. Oh, Jesus, that's cheating. That was frightening. <laughs> who, are, you know, who are the comics that, uh, and this is a, a a question every comedian gets, but I want to ask you because you do have such an unusual style. Who were the comics that affected you the most? 
number one is Ronnie Shakes, who uh, he died very young, but he did maybe 10 appearances with Johnny Carson. And I'll tell you his most popular joke, which was, uh, I've been seeing the same shrink for 12 years. Yesterday, he said something brought tears to my eyes. No obligation. Grace. <laughs> But he had a very, like a 1940s delivery. Yeah, right, right. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one more. Yeah, I got thrown in jail on this trumped up charge. They say you get one call. Nobody called. Um, <laughs> Rita Rutner was an influ influence. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, Um, but then, you know, when I moved to Boston, it was so different. The The first compliment I got in Boston was from Barry Crimmins. Oh, yeah. We we did a show, the first, my first gig in Boston was at a place called Dante's in, uh -huh. I think in somewhere on, in, in Newport. And Barry Crimmins and Mike McDonald, Mike Donovan, uh, all the usual suspects were on the bill and me. And after the show, Barry came up, he said, hey, you know, for a guy from New York, you're not such a big asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as warm as Barry got. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we got, we developed a friendship. He was the only comedian my father liked because he, my dad was a left-wing guy. Right, right. Um, yeah, my father-in-law was, um, he was extremely left wing. He was a, an avowed communist, and he um, he was he ran for the Senate in New York back in like 1990, and uh, and so I was trying to help him raise money for his campaign, and so I asked Barry Crimmins because Barry was a huge fan of my father-in-law, who was a he was a published author and a what was his professor, name? Joel Covell, right. and. He was uh he had a chair at Bard College for a lot of years and uh he's got textbooks that are taught all over the world. And so Barry came up and and my father in law was a huge fan of Barry's and they had never met. And so Barry got got in a car with me from Boston and we drove like three hours to I think it was like Buffalo, New York, three or four hours, uh, to do a show for free at a at a college to really? raise money for the uh and about I don't know, twelve people showed up. <laughs> Jeez. And Barry was like, do you think I could have just written him a check for $120? <laughs> yeah. Well, I will see you a communist father-in-law and raise you two communist parents. Both of my parents were communists and they were subpoenaed by, uh, by McCarthy. No kidding. By the um, House on American Activities Committee. Wow. And what happened? They took the fifth. They did. Did it affect their careers in any way? Well, my dad went from being a communist to, uh, and, and my mom died when I was very young, but then, then he became interested in very wealthy women. He did a complete 180. Really? Yeah. And he married four other women and one of them twice. Really? After my mom died, yeah. Wow. He married the heir to the Bloomingdale estate. Uh, I lived in the carriage house on that estate in, in Scarsdale, not far from Tarrytown. No kidding. Yeah. How old were you? 25. And you were working as a comic in New York City and you were living oh, no, in a no, carriage no, I, house? No, I, I was writing songs. I hadn't. Oh, that's right. You were in a band. Yeah. Yeah. But even before the band, I, I, wrote, I wrote many songs. Uh huh. And they were at the risk of exaggerated medium, mediocre, my songs. I, did, I couldn't write a good lyric. The music was good. So you needed a partner. You needed a, uh, you needed an Elton John for your, or you needed a Bernie Tauper. Yeah. Yeah. And so did your father inherit money from each of these women? No, in, fact, no, in fact, B. Bloomingdale, his wife, sued him when they got divorced for every fucking penny he had, no. which is not a, not a lot of money. On what grounds? I don't know. What, on 
on the grounds of just that he shouldn't have left her. Wow. Damn. Yeah. That's a rough one. Yeah. But he he did marry this one woman. Uh, that's too boring. No, no, I want to hear it. This is great. He, he married a woman named Claire, and we called her Uncle Claire because she was built like Johnny Unitas. Um, <laughs> and she didn't like me or my sister, especially my sister. Uh, I have an older sister who's 75, two years older than me. Uh huh. Two and a half years, and she's been living in Puerto Rico for the last forty years. Wow. Yeah. She get hurt during the the hurricane. She did okay. You know, she was yeah. lucky where she yeah. was, but they have uh, they have all kinds of electrical problems there, and uh, the government is very corrupt. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. And not getting enough support from. Uh, the mainland to, no. to, to rebuild. No, we haven't even talked about what a fucked up pr president we have. This is. It's uh, it's, there's a lot of stress going on right now. There's a lot of, everybody's yeah. like feeling depressed and anxious and, um, and they don't know why they keep looking at their personal lives or how much money they have in the bank and saying, why am I so stressed out? It's like, because Daddy's crazy. Right. I actually felt sorry for him today for the first time that the, I, I don't think he's ever experienced actual joy in his life. Mm. To, not because he's stupid, but because he's cruel. He's mm. so cruel in what he does politically. Mm. And always has been. Andy Kindler's father was evicted from a, an apartment. Oh no no, he he worked for Trump, Kindler's father, and never got paid. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people got got uh, stuck with their hand out with him. You know, yeah. Ho holding the bag. Is that the uh, is that the expression? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you know it's tough because you've got it's so weird that we had so much stress from a pandemic, and by the way, and again, your tweet. So many people don't know how to make jokes about what's happening uh, in, during difficult times. Like every, nobody feels like it's, it's the right place to be funny during a pandemic. Yeah, and I yeah. think that through your Twitter account, you've actually shown that, uh, that you can make it very funny. I just, I want to read some of your tweets about the pandemic. Um, Please, I don't, I, I will have totally forgotten them by now. Well, and some of them are about the uh, demonstrations as well. I think we need a national day of mourning. Tuesdays work for me. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and then um, many, many countries, in including the U.S., are using monkeys to test potential treatments for COVID-19, all but crippling the already struggling organ grinder business. <laughs> I worked so hard on that joke. I'm so <laughs> glad you liked it. Um, uh, my my wife and I find ourselves sitting in front of the TV for hours until one of us turns it on. Yeah, that's just an old joke, but yeah, thank you anyway. That's great. Um, um, yeah. I feel like I owe you at least one good pedophile joke, having it's, watched all this, all of your previous guests. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really, I told this joke, at the wrong time, and I'll tell you that after I tell you the joke, but there was a Boy Scout troop, which was, um, got stuck in the forest for two weeks. And the the troop, I don't know, what do you, what do you call the guy who's the leader? Troop master. The, the, the troop master was able to survive uh, by living just on wild berries and semen. <laughs> um, but, I, I told that joke once when we were recording. <laughs> we were recording Dr. Katz, and at that moment, there was a group of nuns being led into the studio to hear the recording, uh -huh. and then they made a U-turn to leave. <laughs> Did you have a lot of groups of nuns coming in for the recordings? Was that a regular thing? 
I don't understand the occasion. I think we live near a church. That might have been it. <laughs> and nuns would just kind of wander in? Yeah. Well, it's the least, it's the least I can do. We check. Um, um, so, all right, so let's talk about um, I, the fact that I think you can die knowing you've succeeded. A true success. You've had, uh, you had a woman's, a tattoo of your face on a woman's calf I saw on the internet. Yeah, but why, why do you think I'm dying anytime soon? You know, I feel fine. I appreciate the sentiment. Um, um, so was that, oh, uh, was that, did that creep you out or did that, do you take that oh, as no, a nice compliment? I love that. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I, I'm like you, I'm so needy. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if I had enough, I would stop telling jokes, but I don't think I'm going to do that ever. If you had enough self-esteem or if you had enough... No, uh, just, just of nourishment from other people. Right. You know, it's this, it's the thing called adula adulation that we love so much. Right, right. And it's not, I know it's not good for us in the long run, but it sure feels good to get on stage and have a bunch of strangers so happy to see you. Right, right. I know, it's so much you read about happiness is supposed to be about getting rid of your ego. And then what we do for a living is literally the opposite of that. And so you try to make peace with that somehow. You try to have yeah. a, you know, a happy marriage and relationships with your kids and all the things that take compromise and humility. And yet then you go out at night and you get on stage and you demand everybody shut up and listen to you, <laughs> right. and you're the most important person in the room. Right. It's pretty presumptuous. I, I, have, to, I have to warn you about this child rearing stuff. It never stops. You're going to yeah. be just as worried about your kids in 20 years from now as you are today. Is that right? Yeah. No. You kidding. know that. No, I mean, I don't feel like my parents worried about me later in life, but. Uh, well, you're more evolved than your parents. Yeah, that's probably true. But aren't you? Yes. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Do wait. I want to go back to your neediness. When you say you you need nourishment and all that, is that from audiences? Which is more important to you, from your audiences or from your peers? Oh, that's a good one. But I think both. You know, when I started out at the Improv in New York, I loved getting my first laugh on stage. Um, I'll tell you the joke. Uh, I've been called a white Paul Simon. Uh, but even more important was when the comedians at the bar appreciated my comedy. Guys like John Heyman, Ron Zimmerman. Sure. Um, John Heyman is a, one of the funniest guys ever. Oh, yeah. He's great. He's great. I can remember. What years were that when you started in New York? I started in 81. That's about the time when I was going to the clubs. I was a teenager. And uh, on the weekends, me and my friends would go into Catch a Rising Star in the improv. And we went, and that's why I knew John Heyman very well. I mean, we used to sit and watch him and, um, you know, even Paul Reiser was around the clubs at that point. Yeah, sure. Uh, Belzer was around. Oh, Belzer was great to watch. Yeah. I, I, the Adrian Tulsh, the late Adrian Tulsh sure. told me, if you're going to go to see, if you can sit in the audience with Belzer on stage, don't move. Yeah. You don't want to be a moving target. Right, right. And that night I heard somebody, some woman heckle him, and she said, nice jacket, where'd you get it? She said, I got it in your mother's uterus. Everything was on sale. <laughs> but just didn't even take a beat, you know? Yeah. So when you, when you started finding your own audience, because you talk about, you know, you've talked about later in life with, with Dr. Katz, you started to draw your own crowd. Right. And that was a huge turning point for you. And 
So ha did that start to feel like what you'd been missing all those years? Yes, absolutely. People who were showing up to see me perform, uh, it was a great feeling. Yeah. You have that experience, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think I do. I mean, with the podcast, you certainly get people to come out. And I think the difference is um, when you go to a club and nobody knows who you are, you're spending half your energy with the premise of like, all right, this is my life. This is my point of view. This is my wife and my relationships. And when they know you already, like from Dr. Katz, they're walking into the audience and they've already got the premise. And now you can go straight into the funny part. Well, they know Dr. Katz, who's not really me. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. Um, but hey, Greg, you know that pin you talk to people about, the Greg Fitzsimmons pin? Sure. Can I see one? Yeah. Oh, you're kidding me. That's great. Isn't that fantastic? That is great. Do you want to get one made of yourself? Uh, no. Why not? You can, sell, you can sell them on your website. You know, I, I'm not really in that business. But <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind selling your pins on my website. Would you? That would be fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I, I decided a long time ago not, not to be a merchant. Uh-huh. Um, right. I love earning money, but I don't, I don't like to be the guy negotiating the details. Yeah, right. Um, well, well, you've got a good agent. You're at, uh, what are you, at CAA? No, I, I do have an agent at CAA who has never brought anything to me. Uh -huh. When I have a deal that, that my manager found, yeah, he, and I've had a few managers, he'll, he'll do the paperwork. Um, but I, I have a manager named Bruce Smith now. He probably oh, know I know him. Bruce very well. Yeah. 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 He's great. He's very, great. Yeah. Um, but Lou Viola was a manager for a while. Oh, sure. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Burns was the best. And she still manages, but only Paula Poundstone, who is another great Boston comic. Yeah, that's right. People forget about her. They forget she came out of Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But um well it's it's an interesting career that you have. I mean in terms of representing you, it's uh it's it takes us an understanding of who you really are in order to to bring you projects. Yes. And a That's lot true. of representatives just they have one oh, way they I, do business. They want I see where this Greg, I see where this is going. Yes, you can represent me. I want to sign you. I want to sign you. <laughs> I'm all, and I'm only going to take 1%. That's the difference. That's how big Whoa. I think I can make you. That is tempting. What are you going to do, though? <laughs> how are you going to make a living? Uh, um, pins. I got the oh, pins. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know what I've been thinking lately? Uh, and this is just about myself, uh, is that a man can only serve one master because I've been torn my life, all my life between my adult life between music and comedy. Uh -huh. And now it's music and comedy and technology. Yeah. I love all three of those things, but I, I think you sort of have to give in to one of them. I think just the opposite. I, I think it's about um, tech, like our kids, when it comes to technology, they don't call it technology. And they don't acknowledge that they're going, like we say online and offline, they're never one or the other. It all is so intrinsic to the way they live their lives. It all, right. it just, and I, so I think that if you're going to be a comedian, you have to be using technology, like what we're doing right now. You know, we, we can't go on the road yeah. right now because of the pandemic, but we're still putting our material out there, making people laugh and connecting through technology. Right. What's the most desperate thing you've ever done as a comedian to get a laugh? Oh, I did a, I did a New Year's Eve show out in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Right. The armpit of Massachusetts. Was the, was the club called Plums? 
No, it was a it was a nightclub. It wasn't even a comedy club. Oh. It was a one night New Year's Eve show, and it was a discotheque in Worcester, Mass. And they wanted me to do stand up comedy for twenty minutes leading up to midnight, and then count everybody down. So it's eleven forty, and it's all these girls with big hair and right. guys with you know muscle T-shirts on, and they're all dancing to um, you know uh, the Backstreet Boys. And then all of a sudden, they cut the music. And the disc jockey goes, and now some comedy from Greg Fitzsimmons. And he oh, hits the no. wireless microphone. There's no stage. There's just a dance floor. So I'm standing on the dance floor, surrounded by other people that are sweaty, breathing heavy, have just been dancing, and they're completely confused because they had no idea there was going to be a comedian. And so I start doing jokes, and people are throwing things at me. And I'm so I'm like, walking through the crowd trying to get away from hostile people and I'm not getting any laughs and so I say all right I'll go into the women's room and I'll open the door and I'll and this will make people laugh and I'll yell to the women that are in the stalls so I open the door and uh there's a woman sitting in front it's not a restroom it's one bathroom and there's a woman sitting on the toilet and I've opened the door and she's looking at me and she screams you fucking asshole and it gets picked up on the microphone. Her boyfriend shows up, and now he's looking for me, and oh, I'm no. running through the crowd, and I threw the <laughs> mic down on the, on the ground, and I ran out to my car, and I drove back to Boston. And I just remember oh, being in God. my car with the radio on and hearing them count down to midnight. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> on WBCN. Greg, that's, <laughs> that, is, that is terrifying. <laughs> I. I guess this is not even equivalent to what you did, but I just, I just, I did this act of desperation just for a laugh and new in a new way. Um, and I had the MC tell the crowd that I wasn't planning to go on because I had this migraine headache. Yeah. I think it was at the Improv in, in New York. So, but he's agreed to do a very short set. So please welcome Jonathan Katz. And I get on stage with my hand on my forehead. And I say, thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. And I take, and, she, and I said, do you know what it feels like when you have a woodpecker on your forehead going like this? I take my hand away and there's a fucking stick on woodpecker going like that. It was just so much fun doing that. I invested in a prop. Do you remember um, Brian Frazier? Brian Frazier was such a good comedian. Yeah. And he, I, would, he would go out on stage and he would sing, what would you do if I sang out a key? And then he would spit a key out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great joke. That's funny. I, I talk to him every once in a while because I've been trying to help Nancy, his wife out. Oh yeah. Nancy Is she a Conn. cartoonist or something? Uh no, she she wrote on Raising Dad, a show I created. Oh, okay. Um she's a really good comedy writer. Uh-huh. And I'm trying to get her a, a gig working with somebody else. Oh. Uh, but I did I did arrange for Brian to work with an animator who I I know. Uh-huh. Um yeah, so, he became a, he became a very successful TV writer. A lot of those guys, he was part of the, the cross comedy team as well, and so many of those guys were they were so smart, and you kind of looked at them and you went, yeah, you're a good stand up, but you're going to be an amazing writer. And it was like Jonathan Groff who right. went off to become one of the biggest showrunners in in LA. Yeah, and uh, Chuck Sklar, who's a huge writer, Tom Agna, they were all right. part of that scene, and they all went off and became good writers. Do you remember any Tom Agner jokes? Oh yeah, um, the one about his belt and how he he went into a store and they had a belt and it was it was four hundred and fifty dollars, and he was like, "That's more than my rent. If I bought that belt, that's the only thing I would wear." <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a five minute routine about this yeah. four hundred and fifty dollar belt. It was it was just so smart. I remember his joke about. Um... That he grew up in a small town, and the the local doctor 
happened to be Heimlich. Um, so you go in there with a sore throat and they give you, they give you the Heimlich. Um, but he made it much funnier. Yeah. Well, it's his joke. Yeah, he should. It's not my problem. Yeah, right. But that uh, Brian Fraser joke is brilliant. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, your podcast. Are you still doing the Hey, We're Back? You know, I'm sort of at a turning point now. I, you know, I have certainly have time to do it. Hmm. Uh, it, my podcast was, I made 43 episodes and they're very carefully edited. Um, and it's almost like very short radio plays. Uh, but I love, you know, I, I, rather than getting an actor to pretend he's a funeral director, I'd rather call a funeral director uh -huh. and ask him if he does children's parties. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. But my favorite thing I did on the podcast lately was uh, I, I was calling Comcast. And you know how they every big company says your call is going to be recorded? Yeah. So after a little bit of conversation, I asked him if it was possible for me to get a copy of the recording afterwards because I'm trying to make a good voiceover demo. <laughs> and he said... Um, I'm not sure, Mr. Katz. Let me ask my manager. So, uh, hey, that was a Filipino, by the way. Um, and so he asked his manager, and he said, no, I don't think he could do that. Um, I said, okay. Uh, you know, I've been listening to your whole music, and I think the music I write will work much better for your clientele. Is there any chance I could submit a, a, a recording of my music to you guys? Yes, the manager. Anyway, I just I love this kind of stuff, just <laughs> torturing people. Some poor guy in a third world country oh. making a dollar an hour and yes, you're torturing it's, him. It's a little bit cruel, you know. <laughs> um, um yeah, and then uh and then what about explosion bus? Is that is that coming back? I don't know. That was really Tom Snyder's project. He's the guy that you created Dr. Katz with. Right, and he, yeah. the explosion bus was was his baby, um, yeah. and it was really a wonderful show. I happened to look at it the other day by accident, and it's just really brilliant. Yeah, just just the technology he used, and getting people to appear on that show via YouTube, uh, working with Tom Leopold, who's brilliant. Uh, do you right. know Tom Leopold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. And also a lot of improvisation, which I liked. Mm -hmm. uh, but he worked so hard on that. And it never really succeeded on the scale he wanted it to right, succeed. Right. Yeah. It's very hard to make money online. It is. It really has to be a way you're promoting something else that you're selling or trying to get people to watch or trying to get people right. to come out to your show. But in terms of actually monetizing it, the people that make money on YouTube, the, you know, you're, you have to be getting millions of views and um, you know, it's really, it's hard to, to get that, that magic, that lightning in a bottle that happens when you get numbers right. that are that big. I mean, Rogan, I don't know if you read the news, but Rogan just sold his podcast to Spotify for a hundred million dollars. No. Hundred million dollars. So Jesus. that is they'll exclusively where's, where's air it. And he where's doesn't he, where's he gonna get that kind of money? Oh, oh he sold it. Oh I get no, they're gonna yeah, yeah, they're gonna give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, that's amazing. What are your memories of Joe Rogan when he started out oh, in Boston? This this is this will always haunt me, is that we were at Stitches uh -huh. and I think you know, maybe Sweeney was on the show, possibly Gavin, Janine Garofalo. Uh -huh. And we're all sitting in the in that little room off backstage. Yeah. And there's a guy going on for the first time. He's never done stand-up before. And his name is Joe Rogan. And he killed. Uh -huh. I was so angry that he could just do that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Without, right. without suffering like the rest of us. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he just became a guy who was like a middle act after having done it for a year. And then he was, and then the headliners didn't want to follow him. So he became a headliner after, you know, three years. It was crazy. But it had nothing to do with being on late night TV. It just had to do with his talent. Yeah, right. And, and the fact that he was a black belt didn't hurt. Yes. I think that he had a physical presence on stage that people found like, it's it's almost mesmerizing when somebody is that physically like present on stage. Right. Did did you ever listen to his podcast? Oh sure, I've been on it like twenty times. Oh really? Yeah. And and what is what's the format? Is it different than what we're doing? Uh, no, it's pretty much the same. He goes a little bit. Um, it's very free form, but he also has a lot of knowledge. And so if a topic comes up that he knows a lot about, like especially like psilocybin uh, or uh, the certain conspiracy theories that, that he's always examining. And, uh, but it can be anything. It can be across the board. He, he's just curious about it. I mean, he has, he has people on that are like, uh, you know, biologists or um, astrophysicists. And he's just a very curious guy who's smart enough to draw people out and make it accessible. He has this way of getting people to get big ideas into your into your earbuds in a way that you understand it. Right. Yeah. Jeez, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have the patience for somebody that's smart. Yeah. Who just just got paid 150 million dollars. Yeah. Right. Now a hundred. Don't get crazy. Oh, oh, a hundred. Oh, I yeah. think it's 150. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think he'll make another 50 million in pins. That's his plan. <laughs> All right, listen, Jonathan Katz, this is your second time on the podcast. I think the first time we did it, the audio got screwed up. Oh, right. That was when we were working in Boston together. We were working in Boston, and uh, we were in some crazy big conference room. Yeah, and that night, you told me that a joke I was doing wouldn't work anymore because of the technology had changed. And the joke is, when I'm in New York, I can't tune into the New York accent anymore. I was in a crowded elevator. The elevator man says, call out your flaws. I say, I'm impatient with the elderly. And you, and you said to me, you came up to me and you had the nerve to tell me there were no more elevator men. <laughs> Can you imagine that was a job? That was your job. You showed up, you got in yeah. the elevator. Yeah. And you added a step to a very simple process. That's right. <laughs> What do you think the purpose of the elevator man was? Security? I think, you know, do you ever see this movie Living Out Loud with Danny DeVito and this wonderful actress whose name I can't think of? No. Um, he plays an elevator man uh -huh. and fall, falls in love with one of the women in the building. Uh, but I guess, there, I guess it's a kind of security. I actually, it's funny that we're talking about this because I did it. I, I worked in a uh, brownstone in Back Bay. It was this brownstone and it, it was a block long and each floor was its own apartment and there were five floors. And I was the doorman and people would come in and I would get in the elevator and I knew their floor so I would push it for them. And then we'd get to the floor and the elevator would open into their apartment. Like literally the door would open and that's their apartment. Wow. And then I would go back down in the lobby and I would sit there for an hour and a half doing nothing, two hours. And then somebody else would come in and I'd take the elevator up with them. It was unbelievable. I bet you were a better elevator man than I was a doorman. Were you a doorman? I was a doorman on East 72nd Street in Manhattan at night. I had the night shift. Yeah. And I would fall asleep, first of all. Uh -huh. and, and then somebody would be knocking on the door and I said, do you mind getting that? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I could see they wanted your muscle. It wasn't your yeah. attention. They wanted your muscle. I can't. I forgot that that was my job to open the yeah. door. <laughs> <laughs> the one fucking thing I had to do, I forgot. <laughs> All right. Jonathan Katz, we Thank asked. you for your hospitality. 
Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, check out the audio book of Dr. Katz. What's it called? Dr. Katz, the audio book. Okay. And that's available on audible.com and probably right. other places. And uh, hopefully the, we'll get some new episodes of Hey, We're Back, but you can listen to the back episodes now on uh, Apple Podcasts. And uh, what a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Greg. Okay. We'll see you soon. Okay. Take care. Bye.